I'm Richard, Trails of the City, Footprints of London and other places, and welcome to the fourth instalment of Trails Live History Casts, my weekly Tuesday evening broadcast during this very difficult coronavirus lockdown period that I feature on different London historic characters which I've talked about on various historic walks I've done in Westminster over the years. And this week it's William Bullock, collector, naturalist, antiquarian, entrepreneur, and the man behind the most extraordinary London gallery in the 19th century, the Egyptian Hall. And it's not unlikely that many of you will never have heard of William Bullock or the Egyptian Hall. And I looked into him when devising my walk, The Extreme Pleasures of Wellington's London. This was done in 2015 by way of a bit of a sideways approach to commemorations of the bicentenary of the Battle of Waterloo. Rather than analyse the details of the battle, I talked about London society entertainments at the time, some of which I think we might find a little weird and wild, ruinous gambling, bare knuckle boxing, visiting galleries. Visiting galleries, I hear you say? What can be more genteel than perusing the odd Italian Renaissance masterpiece or two? Well, bear with me. Bullock was born in Birmingham in 1773. His first career was as a gold and silversmith. He marked amongst his patrons the Duke of Gloucester, younger brother of George III. Uh, and at the same time, and from a very young age, he started to amass a great collection of natural history and antiquarian objects, both from his own travels and through a few smart deals, including, including apparently from royal sources. By 1804, his collection was so sizable, he decides to relocate and set it all up in a museum in Liverpool, adding to it a great catch of items from the Leverin Museum, a museum of ethnographic and natural history objects based in London, which was being broken up and shut down at the time. He, a few years after, is made a fellow of the Linnaean Society, the learned society concerned with the study and classification of the natural world, although much to the disapproval of attitudes to self-publicity to be rather distasteful. In 1809 then he decides to up sticks and relocate again coming to London and moving all his collection into a temporary premises to the north side of Piccadilly. While I hope I'm conveying a sense of a man with a great ambition amassing a, an exotic and vast collection which required a grand museum to set them off because by 1812 the permanent building was completed. It was situated on the south side of Piccadilly at the entrance of Old Bond Street about 170 foot across and designed with an Egyptian facade, the first English designed Egyptian looking building and around 100 years before Art Deco and by that time the collection boasted around 30,000 different objects and was dubbed the Egyptian Hall. You walked into a pantherion in which Bullock claimed to display all known quadrupeds, a mixture of taxidermy and models along with birds, fish, insects, corals, shells. In another room was uh, decked out like a medieval grand hall displaying a collection of arms and armory with another room devoted to uh, classical antiquity, vases, amphora, jewellery and so on. It opened in April 1812 to great acclaim in the national newspapers, and I will read excerpts from a couple of their reviews. For example, the London Courier and Evening Gazette opined, this magnificent assemblage is displayed with scrupulous adherence to the arrangements of Linnaeus, and it is now unquestionably the finest collection in Europe. The Globe newspaper stated, it were provided amusement with instruction and 
pleasure with science and was truly captivating, a curious and instructive scene. Well, Bullock by no means stands still, and in 1815 he managed his, manages to acquire Napoleon's carriage. Indeed, the very carriage that Napoleon ate, uh, uh, slept, uh, planned in behind the lines at the Battle of Waterloo. It is said that there was such a crush in people wanting to view it, the poor thing was virtually left in tatters, as displayed in a satirical print by George Crookshank at the time, which I've displayed on my timeline. Well, about that time, Bullock decided that he would set off a number of temporary individual exhibitions, many of which were devoted to epic, historic, large canvases, such as Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, a romantic history painting drawing on a famous horrible sh uh, shipwreck at the time, which is currently in the possession of the Louvre Museum. And it was considered a great coup uh, to be able to display it at the Egyptian Hall. At the same time, he displayed the Christ's entry to Jerusalem by Benjamin Hayden. Hayden was a rather um, shall we say, unhinged artist, constantly in debt, uh, but he made a tidy profit from that first canvas he displayed at the Egyptian Hall, which was just as well because he'd laboured on it solidly for six years. But his next display, he wasn't quite so lucky as it was immediately seized to cover his debts along with all his other completed canvases from his studio. But back to Bullock, in 1819, he decides to sell off his entire and hard put together collection in one job lot and offers it to the government for £9,000, which they turn down, but eventually disposing of it, mostly going to the British Museum. And Bullock focuses on his temporary uh, sensational exhibition of artists and other things including in 1822 the Egyptian archaeological finds of the treasures of Seti I, which had been uncovered by the Italian archaeologist uh, Belzoni, and it, it was the great sensation uh, in London that year. Incidentally, you can still see the Seti I sarcophagus, the same one displayed in the Egyptian Hall in the Sir John uh, uh, Soane House Museum. Uh, more curiously, though, was a, a display uh, about that time of a real live family of Laplanders, replete with sled, mock-up of igloo and all the their national costume and paraphernalia of their daily living. An idea, I think, which we would find rather odd, if not just downright distasteful. Uh, but it was about this time Bullock seems to lose interest in the Egyptian Hall. He goes on the first of many expeditions to Mexico, starting a long and intense study of that country's culture and history, which it is it, it culminates in two substantial exhibitions in London, including lectures from native Mexicans and a learned article about it. And the uh, Egyptian Hall is sold by Bullock uh, finally in 1826, after which it's fair to say it rather goes down market and becomes a byword for displaying the latest gimmick or freak show, Siamese t twins, a Japanese mermaid, which was the head of a monkey attached to a fish, and most popular, popularly of all, General Tom Thumb, the celebrated American celebrity dwarf. So what do we make of Bullock's life? Was he a serious collector, antiquarian, naturalist, or was he, frankly, a showman out for the next sensation to create a splash and earn him a big buck? Well, I think it's all too easy to conclude the latter. And uh, members of the Royal Academy made a bit of a show of returning their preview tickets to certain prestigious uh, of his art events. 
Yeah, but I've seen at least another opinion that in fact he made some very important innovations in the display and interpretation of historical and ethnographic objects, especially with his latter studies on Lap and Mexican culture. And his displays of individual artists were the first such in London. We're all too familiar these days with the latest David Hockney or, or Picasso blockbuster. And indeed, he was working at a time where there was no uh, uh, National Gallery or Tate Gallery. Uh, there wasn't, uh, there were only the Royal Academy or the British Institution, now long gone, which showed temporary exhibitions of artwork uh, to see. So I think really uh, the truth of it lies between the two uh, poles. And for my part, and certainly at this time of the coronavirus lockdown, when we can't go and see any artwork in the flesh at any rate, I just would have loved to have strolled around his pantherion and admired his giraffes and antelope in their savannas and rainforests and joined the melee to gawp at Napoleon's carriage as it was gradually torn to bits. Well, thanks very much for listening again, everyone. Do continue to leave some feedback. Uh, next week, I'm going to uh, go from talking about someone that sounds, I hope, quite sensational and dramatic to polite 18th century society, you might say. And the first woman London historic character. Yes, remiss of me not to have included someone of the fairer sex so far. Uh, so thanks very much again and uh, stay safe everyone. Continue if you can to be upbeat. Stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>